We are in Luke. I uh, hope you haven't forgotten that, but it's Luke chapter uh, 12. And our passage today out of Luke 12 uh, gives us uh, something of a conclusion to the lessons our Lord taught in the verses uh, just before. To simplify, uh, there are really only two, if you'll uh, recall, and they're related to each other. There was uh, first the parable of the rich fool in verses 16 through 21. Uh, remember, he viewed life as uh, just an extended uh, pleasure ride. Uh, <laughs> life consisted for him of nothing but enjoying uh, the things that uh, had, he had uh, accumulated. Uh, he took no thought to God, no, took no thought to the treasures that are found in our, our Creator, our Savior. Uh, the second is related to that, uh, the anxiety uh, that comes from worldliness, um, a neglect of the fatherly care our Heavenly Father has for us. Your Father knows that you need these things, is what Jesus said. He knows that you uh, need these uh, things. And Jesus says, but you seek his kingdom. That's, that's what your responsibility uh, is. And now today we'll see something of uh, what that looks like. Uh, what ought the Christian life uh, to consist of? What makes up this seeking after uh, God's kingdom? And the Lord addresses himself to that now. And I've tried to capture it uh, with uh, the late arriving uh, title and the outline that I've affixed to the lesson, uh, the Christian, above all, is a steward uh, ever ready for his master's return and the in, in the interim uh, faithful uh, to him. So let's read the passage beginning in verse uh, 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men. It doesn't need to be said here, but enough decades uh, flow that it helps to remind us that this word refers to men and women. And you notice teachers in the chapel frequently, men and women, men and women, uh, just to make sure we're not offending anybody, but the, the Greeks had a word for people. So uh, be like people, men and women, who are uh, waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may uh, immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Uh, blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert uh, when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself this is very interesting in verse 37. Truly emphatic, truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, so he shifts his, uh, his parable here, he shifts the metaphor a little bit. Uh, be sure of this, if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too uh, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward when, whom his master will put in charge of his uh, servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says <clears throat> in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, uh, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, 
the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will, so there's three people here at the end of the passage. Uh, this first one who is cut to pieces and now another one in verse 47, that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required and, in, and to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. So we see in uh, the first verse, verse 35, uh, the general statement the Lord wishes to make. His disciples are to be always in the state of readiness, readiness. Uh, following after that in verses 36 through 40 are two illustrations he uses to add color to that demand. And then in the following verses, verses 41 through 48, he introduces uh, the important subject of stewardship. Uh, but both of these emphases attain their importance as a consequence of an essential thing uh, we must understand. What is it? It is that the master is coming again. He's coming again. He's returning to his subjects and will discover what they've been doing uh, while he was gone. If you scan these verses, you can in, in your own time, but you'll notice that nine times uh, the words come uh, or coming and returns or returning are used to describe the master's designs. You might be surprised, probably not, to know that there are some who in an attempt to discount the meaning of the second coming in Jesus' words, posit that he was actually directing their attention to a coming crisis looming in the future and urging them to be prepared to meet the crisis. But it's obvious that Jesus is speaking of himself. And plainly, uh, his message to his followers is, I am coming. I am returning. He says it, the Son of Man is coming. So in the interim, you would do well to be on the alert, be ready and be diligent in faithfulness. As a rule, I, I don't tend to borrow long quotations from other people's works. I'm going to make an exception here because it makes a, a worthy point. I think it was Spurgeon who remarked that all originality and no plagiarism makes for dull preaching. Uh, but this is uh, triple plagiarism because I found it first in Kent Hughes' uh, commentary on the Gospel of Luke, but he was quoting from uh, James Boyce in one of his books, and Boyce uh, was quoting from Arnold T. Olson. So it's like triple or quadruple uh, plagiarism. But Olson wrote this. It's not too long. Ever since the first days of the Christian church, evangelicals have been looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They may have disagreed as to its timing and to the events on the eschatological uh, calendar. They may have differed as to a pre-tribulation or a post-tribulation uh, rapture, the pre or post or non-millennial coming. They may have been divided as to a literal rebirth of the nation of Israel. However, all are agreed that the final solution to the problems of this world is in the hands of the king of kings who will someday make the kingdoms of this world his very own. They all agree with that. And that agreement stems from the overwhelming testimony 
of uh, the scriptures. Of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, Christ's return is mentioned not less than 318 times. One verse in 25 mentions the Lord's return. <clears throat> Jesus often spoke of his return. Uh, he's speaking of it in our passage here. He, he speaks in uh, Mark chapter 8 of him coming in the glory of his Father, uh, and in Matthew 24 of coming in the clouds with great power and glory. At the very moment of his most threatening encounter with his enemies, he would boldly declare in their face, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. The epistles of the apostles and John's apocalypse all shout the good news that Jesus Christ is coming again. And with that being true, how are we to live in anticipation? And Jesus provides the answer. The opening verse uh, gives uh, the general principle, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps uh, lit. Those are two separate ideas, but both aimed at the same purpose. The first, as you can see probably in the margin of your Bibles, is literally to let your loins be girded. We know from uh, several places in uh, the New Testament that the garments of the day were these long flowing uh, robes. Uh, it was for the climate, uh, but it was also so that they could uh, bundle them up and tie them with a, a belt or a sash to allow for uh, necessary work. There's an emphatic you <clears throat> present in the Greek phrasing that emphasizes to whom this is directed. It's as if Jesus was saying, you be the kind of person who doesn't need to be told to keep your loins girded because you always uh, have them girded. You're always uh, ready. It's quite picturesque. It indicates a state of constant readiness. Uh, we talk of arriving at our appointed place with our, our sleeves rolled up, and that, that, that's similar. I can't help but think uh, back to high school and playing football and uh, the occasional fear that would come over me as I stood on the sidelines that the coach uh, would shout out my name, Newman, get in there, <laughs> and I can't find my helmet. <laughs> we always kept our helmets right at our side. Those of you who played, you, you know that, uh, because the call could come at any moment. Get in there. We had to be ready. Uh, the other image is of keeping their lamps lit. And here, too, that you, that emphatic you is there. You keep your lamps lit. Uh, this would be necessary if the coming of the master happened to be at night. It's the same lesson, you probably are thinking it, uh, as found elsewhere in the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, five of those virgins had prepared themselves for the moment of the bridegroom's return, and the five others, sadly, had not. They were, they were left there in the dark. Uh, but those were two essential concerns, if you think about it, in the ancient world, clothing and light. Uh, so Jesus' command would have, would have hit home. And the application to those today who would be Jesus' uh, followers uh, is obvious. Uh, that would be you and me. We are to be constantly alert and in a state of continual preparation and anticipation of our Lord's return. Instead of going about our business and our lives with no thought that he might soon arrive in our presence shouting out our name, he is coming, he will return. Jesus then gives two illustrations to underscore his thought, beginning in verse 36. The first is in a, a positive vein of the servants of a master who has gone away to uh, attend a wedding feast. You, you know uh, the Hebrew wedding feast could stretch out over several days, and 
Uh, while he was away, the master uh, expected his servants to be on call for him when he arrived home. Now, reading this very carefully, uh, take note that the men in the parable are waiting for their master when he returns. Uh, they want to immediately open the door to him when he comes. In the Olivet Discourse, uh, that extended uh, teaching section that is found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels and is uh, Jesus' uh, instruction to his disciples about future events and about his future uh, coming. Uh, he stresses the uncertainty of the time of his return. He even says in Mark 13, 32, of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but the Father alone. No one knows. It's uncertain. So he goes on to say in the verses that follow in that place in Mark, take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. Be on the alert for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. The obvious point then uh, of our parable from the perspective of the servants underscores the uncertainty of when their master would return and therefore their conduct during his absence would reflect on how devoted they were to him and how determined to serve him and to be dependable and reliable. Uh, in his absence, uh, the temptation to distraction and self-interest would inevitably uh, challenge them. What the master would discover when he made his arrival home would reveal the true devotion of those in his hire. And here Jesus describes the ideal uh, homecoming. He finds them waiting for him upon his return. When he knocks, they immediately open the door. Their lamps are burning. Their loins are girded to serve him. They're alert. And Jesus pronounced them blessed because of their faithfulness. It's, it is the, you can feel it. It is the warm and welcome reception from those who love their master and, and, and desire to please him. Not only that, but uh, look in that same verse 37, uh, notice what a part of that blessing is when he arrives. He's gonna turn the tables on them. You look at it carefully. Uh, He's going to gird himself to serve them. He will wait on them as they recline at his table. How wonderful is, is that? No wonder they're called blessed. Uh, later in Luke's gospel in chapter 22 and 20, verse 27 in that scene where the disciples are arguing over which one of them is uh, the greatest, Jesus will say, well, who is greater, the one who reclines? Who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. This is the strange logic of our great God's uh, ways with us. Uh, we are rightly called to serve him, but the truth is he is the one who serves us. Uh, that was Jesus's mantra. Uh, the son of man uh, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom uh, for many. We are the recipients of the royal service of the son of God. And all the while we, ourse we ourselves are in his service. That was the remarkable conclusion the Apostle Paul arrived at in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. You might make a note of that, 1 Corinthians verse 5 in the passage uh, where Paul, he's sort of engaging in an argument. But he's describing himself as the, the servant, the, the steward of God. That, that was his obligation. And remember, some praised him for it and some criticized him. But this was his advice. Wait until the Lord comes. 
<laughs> wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him uh, from God. Receiving praise from God, it's amazing. It's in the same category as him girding himself to serve us and coming to wait on us when at last he comes. That's mind-boggling. Well, the Lord goes on to add in verse 38 something of an added caution, which might be of interest to some in this room. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so blessed are those slaves. The Jews divided the night into three watches. The Romans uh, divided it into four. And Jesus saying reflects that. He speaks, I think, uh, to finishing strong, finishing our lives uh, strong. Whether you think you're in the first watch or the second watch or the third watch, wherever you think you are, uh, the master looks to find us on alert with our eyes peeled for his coming. And that pointed uh, theme of the uncertainty of the time of his coming is taking up again in the following two verses, in verses 39 and 40, but this time with a note of warning. The imagery here is different as the Lord shifts to the picture of a homeowner who, uh, like all homeowners, is liable to a mal malicious burglar who might break into the, their house uh, to rob them. Uh, he is the picture of the neglectful uh, homeowner who has grown comfortable in his own security. I bet you can identify with this. And he's forgotten that he's vulnerable to a surprise uh, visitor. He's something like the rich fool who has lulled himself into thinking that all is well and he can disregard the important uh, disciplines belonging to a person of responsibility. Jesus says, <clears throat> had he known the hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Tell us something we don't know, but the problem is distraction. We do, know that we do need to be reminded of this. The problem is forgetfulness. Uh, first, he's myopic. He only sees the immediate, perhaps the glittery things the world is presenting to him. Or on the other hand, contrary to that, the, the pressing worries of his own life experience. And consequently, his head is always down, always mastered by the perceived urgencies of this life, giving little thought to the grand design of a man's life, uh, revealed to him at one time or another by the Spirit of God, but since blurred by evil forces who would distract him from the most important things that, and keep him from the most urgent uh, priorities. I've told this little story on myself before, I think, uh, but when I was in school, a seminary, I, I was living with my parents by their good graces. I didn't have any money. It was here in Dallas. And looking back, I'm fairly certain I had become quite self-centered and selfish with all the studies and obligations upon me when one evening my dad appeared in the doorway of my bedroom slash uh, study where I was deep in the word and <laughs> he looked at me and said do you ever think about what you're doing he wasn't talking <laughs> about the books he was talking about my behavior he was talking about my attitude. And I thought, you know, no, I don't. But thank you. I, I needed that. I had allowed myself to become so distracted, I lost track of the important things. That happens. It still happens. But secondly, this homeowner is prone uh, to let down his guard, forgetting that 
uh, those workers of evil uh, are out there. Has this ever happened to you? Did you know we left the garage door open all night long? <laughs> Several years ago, we bought a too expensive bicycle for one of our sons. He had begun a fitness uh, regimen. I think it lasted about 60 days. But anyway, uh, one Saturday afternoon, he went out into the garage, uh, opened the garage door, took his bicycle down from the rack, the expensive one that we had just bought him, forgot something in the house, went back in to, to get it, came back out, and there was that bicycle rolling down the alley <laughs> with a happy burglar on it. It just like that. I've softened this story a little in order to protect the guilty. I mean the innocent, but the homeowner in our parable had forgotten that there were evil doers out there who meant him harm and, and he bore the consequences. He wasn't ready. Uh, he had allowed himself to become distracted from what was really important and he had forgotten the dangers of this world that we live in. And so the Lord exhorts his disciples in verse 40, you too be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Sometimes we get so accustomed to the truths uh, that we've learned from the Bible, we lose the sense of wonder we had when we first comprehended them. But this is one of them, uh, Jesus' announcement about the timing of his coming. That's exactly what he speaks of, the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, it had to have been puzzling to his disciples. Uh, they were given a fair warning, but it was not a specific warning. Uh, how he would come at an hour they would not expect. That's a guarantee. He said it. That he's going to come at an hour we would not expect. And the lesson of the parable is, therefore, we should always be prepared in mind and in heart, for we know that he is coming. We just don't know when. And that leads the Lord to uh, beg the disciples' personal stewardship in the interim. And as usual, Peter uh, provides the perfect entree. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? In typical fashion, it's not exactly clear what Peter uh, was asking. Uh, he may have been wondering if the teaching they were hearing applied to all of Jesus' followers or just the 12. Well, as we read on, it becomes apparent it does apply especially to leaders in the church, but the principles uh, belong to us all. And the general principle is given in verse uh, 42. The Lord answers Peter's question with a question of his own. Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Stewardship is, is an important uh, is important in the life of the Christian. God has given to each of us certain uh, gifts, uh, talents, uh, circumstances, special providences, and each of us is responsible uh, to utilize well what God has given us so that we might present a return to Him. The well-known parable of the talents teaches that very thing. One servant, remember, has uh, five talents, and he's invested it, and he gets a return of five. Another one has two, and, and, re and returns two, and so on. And the master's response is, well done, good and faithful uh, servant. On the other hand, uh, there is the servant who has buried his one talent and made no good use of it. And the master's evaluation is harsh. In our parable here, there are several things to, to notice. Uh, one is that the most important responsibility of the steward seems to be 
the care of the other servants, giving them their rations at the proper time is figurative for shepherding, shepherding them so that they have the essential things they need that would necessarily be material uh, possess, uh, necessities when lacking, but more importantly, surely the spiritual care that the Lord uh, desires for them. That doesn't mean the steward uh, lords it over them. After all, they too are slaves. They're called that in verse uh, 43. The picture here is of a, a corporate household made up of slaves. Uh, but including some who have the special responsibility to watch over the others. But the, the eyes of all of them are to be trained on their master. It is his uh, pleasure and approval they are to seek. It is to him that they will ultimately uh, be required to give an accounting. Does that strike fear in your hearts? It does mine. I don't know of any true Christian servant, uh, even and especially those who we think of as especially faithful and, and sacrificial, who don't tremble to some degree at the prospect of giving an account to their master when he returns to demand it. Let's hear it. Give us an account. Don't do it. Well, in the figure we have here, the picture is of a steward to whom the master has given the task of managing a certain estate or possession he owns, and he's embarking on a journey of some kind. And again, uh, the time of his return is uncertain. And notice how the master teacher, our Lord, in instructs his chosen stewards. He presents a blessing on the one hand and terrible judgment on uh, the other. Uh, blessed, he says in verse 43, is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. And so, and so note that, that the pastor, I mean, the master does uh, come. He does not stay away forever. <clears throat> and it would be inconsistent with the tenor of the passage as a whole to suggest that he gave his steward some kind of fair warning that he was on his way, you know, so he could tidy things up a little bit, uh, kind of like perhaps <clears throat> your children do when they visit and they're about to leave, they tidy things up a little bit. No, he arrives in anticipation of discovering how his servant has performed his duties as steward in his absence, and he's delighted to find that he has passed the test with flying colors. He is at his post, as we say, uh, taking care of the master's other servants and of the goods of the estate. Truly, the Lord says, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So here's the reward. Here's the blessing. More work. <laughs> more uh, responsibility. I say that in jest, sort of, but in, it is the nature of the faithful steward that he finds joy and not drudgery in serving his master. Many of you probably just recently read in Genesis chapter 39 the account of Joseph serving as a steward in the house of Potiphar. Moses uh, writes there in Genesis 39, the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And Joseph was such a diligent and faithful steward over the house of Potiphar, he, he couldn't help but see that the Lord was with Joseph. And he caused all that Joseph did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in Potiphar's sight, Moses writes, and became Potiphar's personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. That was a real life example of a, a servant. Uh, uh, remember, Joseph was a slave, uh, performing his duties as unto the Lord, and the Lord gave blessing to him. 
Uh, but then the Lord shows uh, back to our text, uh, beginning in verse 45, uh, what will be the lot of the unfaithful steward. And notice he, he says in his heart, it begins with a bad heart and wrong thinking. And so here is the description, not just of a poor steward, but of one who is not truly a servant of the master. His unbelief leads to cynicism and the mistaken idea that the master will be a long, long time in coming, so long he can behave as wantonly as he wishes. And rather than giving the other servants uh, their rations at the proper time, he begins to beat them, even the women, and he sinks into debauchery and undisciplined living. And when that happens, and notice the now more explicit language of the master's coming compared to that of the sensible uh, steward to whom the master came also at an unannounced time. But now uh, we read that the master comes on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. It feels as if there is a special kind of eagerness here on the part of the master to return to where he, from where he had come and, and confront this wicked steward. And the language uh, matches the mood. Jesus says he'll, he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That's a head scratcher. He will cut him in pieces. It may be that uh, that was a common phrase of the time to indicate a, a brutal consequence. But it's possible the Lord meant exactly that. Uh, the description of the wicked man and his wicked behavior begs for some kind of commensurate justice, justice and the Lord is surely indicating that. Well, now he concludes uh, the parable with words indicating a principle of proportionate accountability. Two servants are compared or contrasted with each other, uh, one of whom knew his master's will and one who did not. Uh, neither proved reliable stewards. Both acted in disobedience to the master's standards, but the one who knew his will but ignored it and violated it will receive a greater punishment than the one who was, for some reason, ignorant of it. So both will be punished, or if you will, disciplined. Both will receive discipline. Both will receive it for not living up to the demands of their master. Uh, the Bible uh, provides no easy escape from God's righteous judgment. No matter the extent of their knowledge of the truth, all have sinned and uh, fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. So there's mercy to be seen here in the discipline meted out to these last two servants. servants but also an important message in the Lord's final words, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Uh, that would especially, I believe, apply to all of us in this room. We have been given much. Uh, we have been entrusted uh, with much. And consequently, the Lord requires more from us. That's surely what James had in mind in his epistle when he warned, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. It's too late for me, <laughs> for many of you too, uh, but we understand the logic. We comprehend the truth of it. God has poured his blessings upon us and he rightly expects from us 
that we steward those blessings to his gain, to his glory, and to the end that when he comes, he finds each of us at our post, doing what we're supposed to be doing, doing it as unto him, and doing it in the spirit of Joseph. He is coming, and we eagerly wait for his appearance. Let's close. Come, Lord Jesus, is what we say. We call it the blessed hope. You've called it the blessed hope, and it is bless, uh, Lord. And we, we do say, come, Lord Jesus. Uh, how grateful we are that we serve a risen Savior, but also we serve a master who is returning uh, to establish a kingdom uh, here on this earth according to his promise. And Father, we're grateful that you are gathering kingdom members uh, even as we speak, and we are those whom you have gathered. May we live lives of preparation, of readiness, uh, of responsibility in the interim. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.